Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Rick Steves Festival of Europe. I'm Lisa Friend, and I'm delighted to be your moderator this evening as we explore the beauty and diversity of La Belle France. Tonight, we are joined by our favorite Francophile, an American who had the good fortune to spend part of his childhood in France and loves to share that country with us. And a French woman who had the good fortune to spend part of her adulthood in the great state of Montana. She has relocated back to France, but keeps in touch with American culture by guiding our tour members through France. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce the first of this pair, Bienvenue Steve Smith. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Lisa. Merci. And tonight, um, it's good to be here. Virginie, I'm going to just get started with this. Welcome, everybody, and thank everybody who's watching for deciding to spend this hour with Virginie and me. We are taking this tour to France, this Festival to France tonight. There are three more talks to give, as, as Lisa mentioned. Tomorrow night, Germany, Austria, Switzerland. Sunday, we've got Central, or what we used to call Eastern Europe. And Monday, as Lisa said, the grand finale. This image reminds me that a huge part of any successful trip, I think particularly to Europe, is the guide that you have with you, whether it's just for a museum or for a day or half day, or the guide for your, your entire trip. We think we've hired the best in the business at Rick Steves and think you'll agree. Lisa mentioned the city tour giveaway, whether Paris, Rome, London, or Istanbul, there's the details on it. Anybody who is signed up for any of the talks is eligible. Guess which tour Virginie and I would choose for you on this one. Virginie leads the Paris tour and she will be talking to us about that shortly. And this is a call to action. Save a hundred bucks per person if you sign up by February 5th. All right. And um, just worthwhile to do that. All right. Here are the five tours we offer in France. We have Best of Paris in seven days, Paris in the heart of France in 11 days. It's really the northwestern corner of France with the Loire and the Normandy and Paris. Loire to the south of France, which is really the best of Western France with a little bit of the south, the best of Eastern France and in 14 days and My Way, which is an independent type of tour that I lead sometimes, which is good fun in 13 days. This image uh, allows us to get oriented to France. There it is in, I'm colorblind, but I think that's purple. In the center of Europe is France. Um, and it, it just to get oriented, it's about 80% the size of Texas with two and a half times its population. It's about 600 miles from top to bottom or east to west. Figure 10 hours by car, an hour by plane, or three and a half hours by bullet train. The rail system in France is phenomenal. I just love it. So any excuse I can to not drive, France offers that. Here we are for over 37 years now. I've been trying to teach Rick the art of French living, and he's been teaching me, well done, Rick, the uh, science of guidebook writing. Together, we've produced books, maps, audio tours, phrase books, you name it, all to help our travelers navigate this country that we love so much. And nine years ago, we teamed up with this woman who you've been introduced to already. And now you can see Virginie Moret. Welcome, Virginie. Hey, what time is it there? And uh, where are you? Bonjour, Steve. Bonjour, Lisa. Bonjour, everybody. Comment ça va? I hope everybody's doing well. It's uh, I'm doing pretty well. It's three in the morning. I'm in uh, Burgundy, uh, bright and awake. And uh, thank you for joining us to learn more about France on this show today. Good to have you aboard, uh, Virginie. You'll be talking much more in this in this talk, I know. And to continue on, oh, oh, okay, let's go. Okay, you are screen sharing. We don't want to advance. Hmm. Okay, there we go. Well, France is um, filled with a uh, uh, country peppered with iconic images and dazzling countryside and scenes from monumental Paris in the north to the Riviera capital in the sunny southeast in Nice. You'll pass pastoral landscapes like this in Northern France to sunny rock sculpted villages in the South in Provence, just like this. France has two distinctly different coastlines. To the West, the cold, rather shivering, but high cliffs and dramatic Atlantic Ocean with these cliffs of Etretat line the Western limit of France in the North. And to the south, bordering the southern limit, is the warm Mediterranean, where cactus thrives and the sun shines over 300 days a year. And if it's Europe's tallest peaks you must see, you got to get to France, guys, because Mont Blanc, almost 16,000 feet, is in France, in Chamonix, 
where we are sitting here having this nice glass of wine. And this borders the eastern side of France to Italy and, um, and uh, Austria. I'm sorry, Italy and Switzerland. The, there are two other mountain ranges in France, lesser known, the Pyrenees, and here the Cirque de Gavarni, which border Spain and allow access across to that part of the great part of Europe. And the really unknown Massif Central mountain range, kind of hidden in the southeastern corner of France, hides or holds Europe's greatest canyons. And I highly, I mean, I love nature. So I love the Gorge de Verdun. This is Europe's and France's Grand Canyon. Every region in France offers its own culture and cuisine. Mm. One day you could be strolling down this Hansel and Gretel village in Alsace, which is landlocked, eating sauerkraut smothered in ham, sausage, and mustard and potatoes, drinking Riesling wines. While the next day, uh, 600 miles across, 10 hours by car, as I said, you could land in Virginie's region where she was born in Brittany where you would be greeted by lads like this who look more Irish, I think, than French, because in Celtic Brittany, they are more Irish than French. And kids who made, who were raised on crepes, and I don't know that they've ever seen sauerkraut in their lives. In the southeastern corner of France, Louis, locals look muy Spanish, and paella is on most menus. And in that Italian bordered southeastern corner, the what me worry, happy-go-lucky reception you get in that part of France, is evident every day and fresh pasta is on the menu, is in most shops. All this diverse diversity uh, that we wanna take you through now, but first Virginie, I have to ask, okay, let's see if I can do this. You're from Brittany, right? I am from, and Did I you... ate crepe every single day of my life in Brittany. No, I'm kidding. Okay, uh, but you did. I mean, crepes are really popular, right? I mean, that, that, oh, it's not I just- I only eat crepes when I'm in uh, Brittany, Nowhere else in France, except in the Western part of Paris, which is Breton neighborhood in Paris. Yes. Yeah. And you get home all the time, I think, right? Yeah, pretty often. What, what drink goes with crepes? That's why I don't eat them. I can't think of a good wine that goes with them. Uh, Northwestern France doesn't have any vineyards. So we have apple trees though. And so it's cider. However, tonight I decided not to open cider because I'm in Burgundy where I live and I opened some Beaujolais wine to, uh, you know, to drink at three in the morning. And Steve, what are you drinking? Today? I decided from my, I'm just where I live, where my house is, uh, I'm just what, 45 an hour north of uh, Virginie. This is Chardonnay country. And this time of night, I'm drinking white wine Chardonnay from uh, from the Côte de Beaune, near Beaune. Santé, oh, Steve. Uh, and Santé, cheers to everybody out there. Thank you. Okay, Virginie, let's take off. Let's take these people through France. What do you say? And let's see if I can figure this out. And off we go to... I don't know why that's not working. Paris, take us away, Virginie. Let's start our journey through France in Paris. And hopefully you have a full week because the capital has a lot for you to see from a world-class museum, uh, charming neighborhood, stunning architecture, and top-notch restaurants, if that's what you're interested in. Now, you can travel to Paris all year long. Uh, if you decide to come in the winter time, this you'll understand why it's called the city of light. And you'll experience less crowds, uh, same for museum, less crowded museum and cozy cafes where you can easily warm up. But if you decide to travel in the peak season, uh, it will be for sure more crowded. However, you're going to be able to enjoy how the Parisians enjoy life. This is, you know, France. We just uh, don't, uh, we, we work to live. So we need, it means that we need to enjoy life. And that's what you see here. Uh, in Paris, I would start by uh, going to the Ile de la Cité which is the island on the Seine River with a history work, historic walk that would help you understand the origin of the city and actually see two of its uh, medieval sites, such as Notre Dame that you see here. Now, Notre Dame will not open until uh, the end of the year, but by summer, on this picture, which is a bit outdated, um, the steeple has actually been rebuilt, but the scaffolding around the steeple will be removed in the summer. But not far from Notre Dame, you have the Saint Chapel, which is the other uh, medieval site that we have in this neighborhood. And this is a jewel of Gothic architecture. Uh, you go in and you're going to be dazzled by over 6,500 square feet of stained glass window. So the best example of Gothic architecture you can have in Paris. Now, when you leave the Ile de la Cité, 
you can go explore the left bank uh, neighborhood. And in the left bank, that's where you have the Latin Quarter. This is where the students uh, were in the Middle Ages and where the Sorbonne University still is today. This is also the writer neighborhood. And for uh, fans of Hemingway's or Fitzgerald, this is a real pilgrimage because this was their hangout place, the Shakespeare and Company bookstore. Now, in the southern part of the left bank, you have the Luxembourg Garden. That's the biggest garden we have within the city of Paris. And you know, you, you're going to be doing so much in Paris that you need to take a break and relax and enjoy the city. Uh, watch the kids playing with their sailboat, take a chair, be a Parisian. And you need that relaxing time because I'm taking you on to the big museum of the Louvre now. And uh, you do need to have rest fit to explore the Louvre and you won't be alone in the Louvre. So maybe time well when you want to go. Uh, it's open late on Friday evening and you'd have the beautiful uh, light on, on, the, on the building. And this would be a good opportunity for you to think about hiring a guide or at least use the guidebook. We have a, walkie, um, a guided tour of the Louvre or you can listen to Rick uh, audio tour because you're going to go from Greek antiquity to masterpieces like the Mona Lisa among many other uh, amazing arts. So uh, be smart and think about having a, a guide for um, or a book for the Louvre visit. Now, not far from the Louvre, I'm taking you now to the Place des Vosges. Now, this is just a couple, a few blocks away from the Louvre. And keep in mind that when you're in Paris, uh, it, it's a walkable city and we have a great metro system. So you're never far away from, from any place. But Paris is not just a lot of museum. It's an outdoor museum in itself uh, with stunning architecture like this uh, square, which is in the heart of the Marais district. Now, the Marais district is the old uh, Jewish neighborhood of Paris, and it's uh, today the, the trendiest uh, neighborhood with lots of fancy shops and cozy cafe for you to explore. Uh, we have several beautiful neighborhoods in Paris, but my favorite one is Montmartre, uh, which is nicknamed La Butte, La Butte, the Butte, because it's on top of the hill with the uh, iconic Basilica of the Sacré-Cœur. Now, to enjoy Montmartre, you have to go early. Uh, because you won't be the only one. And um, Montmartre used to be where the artist uh, hanged out in the late 19th century. So it still has that bohemian feel. And it's actually for many people, this is not Paris. Uh, the people who live there don't call themselves Parisians. They call themselves the Montmartre people. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're going to see the next Van Gogh or the next Renoir, who knows? And uh, talking about the Renoir, this is where he painted this famous master chief, um, Bal au Moulin de la Galette. And I think he, he really managed to capture the essence of this atmosphere of uh, Paris at the time, of the easy uh, lifestyle of Montmartre. Now, if you want to see that painting, that's what I love about Paris. In the morning, you could be walking where Renoir used to live. And then in the afternoon, you have an impressionist day by going to the Orsay Museum. Uh, this is the second most important museum in Paris where uh, there is uh, impressionist art in the old train station. And then that's where you would see the Bal au Moulin de la Galette. And then just across the river, a more intimate museum, which focus is on the big water lilies painted by Monet. And I love this museum because you really get face to face with those huge canvases and it feels like you're inside a park or you're actually visiting the place where he painted, uh, painted them. So we keep you busy right in Paris. And I think what's very important is to, to find a good neighborhood that, that, that works for you. And uh, when I lead the Paris tour, all of our groups stay in the seventh district of Paris. And most of them stay at the uh, Londres Eiffel where you have a great staff that will make you feel like you have a home in Paris. And in the seventh district, we have the Rue Claire. Every arrondissement of Paris, arrondissement is a district, we have 20 of them. Every, no, every one of them has a half pedestrian area, such Rue Claire here. And I know that Rue Claire is Steve's favorite. And can you tell us why, Steve? I thought you'd never ask. 
Uh, yeah, you know, it reminds me, you've covered the Luxembourg Garden, the Marais, the Montmartre area, and now the 7th or the Rue Claire area, as we call it. Uh, a reminder our, to our readers that we focus our hotels and restaurants just on those four neighborhoods. That allows us to keep it up to date, because I'd rather sleep in a great neighborhood with an average hotel than in a great hotel in a crummy neighborhood. And that's what I think our success is. And I, you're right. I love this area. Back to you, Virginie. So... It's just, you know, I was talking about Paris being an outdoor museum and, you know, the Parisians live there. It's not a museum to them. And just around the corner from the Rue Claire is the Eiffel Tower. Now, again, plan ahead. Uh, you can book online to go to the top or you can book a tour if that's what you'd like to do. You can go uh, by elevator to the third floor. My favorite floor is the second. And actually, if if you didn't plan well, you can actually walk to the second floor. It's not that bad. And I would time it to go by the end of the day. So you get to enjoy the, the sites, the architecture, recognize the monuments you've seen during the day, and then still enjoy sunset and get to see Paris lit at night, which is, I mean, it's, it doesn't get old. I went there last time was in October, and it, it never gets old to go on top of the Eiffel Tower. You love it. Now, another monument you could decide to climb, it has less steps, 286, I believe, is the Arc de Triomphe. And the Arc de Triomphe was commissioned under Napoleon I. And from the, to the top, you'll have that sprawling view of the Avenue des Champs-Élysées, uh, which is the, uh, known as the Fifth Avenue of Paris. And at the end of that avenue, you have the Louvre Museum. So it gives you a good perspective on Paris. And then you could decide to walk down the Champs-Élysées and do something that every French person does at some point. It's called lèche vitrine. And lèche vitrine um, means window leaking, which means that you don't have to use your credit card, but you still get to see the fancy uh, jewel shops and macaron and cafe and so on. Now, when I lead the Paris Week tour, I love to finish uh, with my group on the Seine River cruise. And uh, I always time it to be at sunset. And it's a good way to recap what we've been doing during the week. So what we've seen together. And uh, you get to see the monuments lit at night. So we have uh, Notre Dame, uh, which is always different at night. And then of course the Eiffel Tower, which is uh, sparkling on the, uh, on the hour. So I think you realize that uh, we can keep you busy for at least a week. And in addition to that, we have uh, something that most people do is an excursion to uh, Versailles. It's a, it's a good day trip, one hour door to door from your hotel to the gate of this great palace. Uh, this is also book ahead. And I didn't mention, uh, mention it yet, but uh, it's a good idea if you're going to, um, to visit many sites to take the museum pass. Uh, even though you still need to book with a museum pass, it gives you access to Versailles, for example. Now, mm -hmm. Versailles under Louis XIV was crowded. So if it's crowded today, it's always been like that. And it's another, it's like the Louvre. Uh, hire a guide, make sure you follow an, uh, a tour, an audio tour, because you're going to go from one gilded room to another one which, with this shiny chandelier and huge paintings. And you need to understand the power uh, that France uh, under the Sun King had all over, all over the world at the time. Now, there is the Palace of Versailles, and then you have the gardens of Versailles, lavish gardens that were created to impress, and they're still impressed today. And uh, they also do sometimes some music and fountain show like they used to do uh, under the Sun King. So let's go a little bit further from Paris now, but just an hour away by, uh, by train in the town of Chartres. Uh, this is also where we start the Loire House tour. And uh, the main interest in Chartres is its cathedral. It's also called Notre Dame, Notre Dame de Chartres, except that it's less crowded. And it's more authentic Gothic architecture because it has never been heavily restored. Uh, the inside, however, has been um, cleaned up in the, in the past few years and it's super bright. And you're going to be able to enjoy from very close up the amazing stained glass windows. Now, Chartres is known for its uh, special blue color, the Bleu de Chartres. And if you're into stained glass window, there is a, a great museum to understand more um, this medieval art. Now, what I love about Chartres is the fact that it has 
two towns into one. The upper town is where you're going to have the cathedral. And then in the lower town, focused around the Ur River, you're going to have the old medieval town and with half timbered houses. And even though you're just an hour away from Paris, you get to see what life is outside of a big city. Uh, it's very picturesque. And I think it's worth, it's worth for you to actually stay one night, mm -hmm. at least one night, I would say, because in the evening, they have a, a amazing sound and light show over 20 different facades of Chartres, but the main one being the, the cathedral that you have here. And I know on tour, this is a warm moment for, uh, for many of my travelers. Um, I think we are done with this part of uh, center around Paris and Steve is going to uh, take you away, a little bit further away, I think, right, Steve? I am, and I want to remind what you said, highlight it. Book your museum and, and principal site reservations ahead of time. Get a museum pass for most of the sites that you want to see. But uh, ever since COVID, booking ahead is almost imperative, I think, in Paris. Let's escape that city. And it's amazing to me how quickly you have beautiful scenery like this, leaving a city of 10 million people as you head west, tracking the Seine River, as I am now, stopping an hour outside of Paris at the home where Claude Monet cultivated his art, and his flowers during the last 40 years of his life. He also cultivated quite a following today that you'll run headlong into if you don't read your guidebook before you go. We go to great pains to help you understand how to avoid crowds like this so you can enjoy the gorgeous flowers and scenery that Claude Monet worked so hard to create in its peaceful environment. An hour a little bit further away, west and south, lies the beautiful city of Bayeux, and a great base for touring the D-Day beaches. This is a lovely city of about 10,000 people with some important sites of its own. It's tapestry, the Bayeux tapestry here is um, about 70 yards long, about three feet high, about a yard high. And it uh, uh, depicts the Frenchman, um, William the Conqueror's defeat of Harold, the Englishman Harold at the Battle of Hastings in the year 1066. You can tour this. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's one of the most important medieval documents there is left anywhere in Europe. And it used to hang in this grand cathedral, a brilliant cathedral, as a as sort of a, a propaganda document against the English. Now, those are the two key sites in Bayeux, but Bayeux is also um, handy for... Uh, just minutes away, really. It's the first city to be liberated during the D-Day invasions. And here you can experience the heroic uh, efforts of and the courage of the British, Canadian and American soldiers who fought so hard to create, the, to establish a beachhead here and start the liberation of Europe. I highly encourage you to find some time alone to wander the D-Day beaches. As an American, a Canadian, or a Brit, you had a lot to do with European history in this particular region, which is why I also like hiring a guide, whether it's a small minivan tour, a private guide for yourself, or on our Brick Steve's tour right here. Having an expert to explain this history to you, particularly for Americans and Canadians, I think is hugely important. Here you can travel the 54 miles of Atlantic coast and track Hitler's defense wall here at Long sur mer and, and find remnants of the 13,000 or museums dedicated to the 13,000 paratroopers who landed in the dark behind the lines and gazed down these steep cliffs at the cliffs where the rangers, over 220 of them, scaled using ladders and grappling hooks from the London Fire Department at the Pont du Oak. This is powerful stuff. Now, the small town of Aromash was ground zero for the D-Day landings. Here, almost overnight, you can see out into the um, bay there, these huge concrete slabs were towed across to create almost overnight this artificial harbor, temporary harbor, where after only six days of operation, they were able to offload over 100,000 tons of material, 300,000 troops, and over 50,000 vehicles to support the troops as they went forward and established the liberation of Europe. There is a brand new museum. Oh, it's so nice. I got to see it. I like day three, it was open that honors that event in Aromash, the building of that harbor and all that went into it and its importance. A good last stop on the D-Day beaches is the American cemetery here. Here where over 9,300 gleaming white stars of David and white crosses stand above Omaha beach. 
dead uh, in honor of the soldiers who died here, trying to save the lives of people they could not know. If you're Canadian, we also describe in our book, the Canadian cemetery, which is typically Canadian, I think much lower profile, but a beautiful cemetery as well to visit. An hour south of there, of the D-Day beaches, that Normandy is just packed, isn't it? With good, from Juvenie to the D-Day beaches to Mont Saint-Michel here. In Europe's largest tidal change sits this abbey, where since the sixth century, sixth century, hermit monks came to find solitude, which they found until the 1800s, when this causeway that you see below the island was established, allowing cars to park there, if you can see them in this little image, and visitors to access the island. And most importantly, it stopped the circulation of the water around the island. 200 years later, about eight years ago, this bridge was built and connected to a, a distant parking lot by, by uh, shuttle buses, allows, most importantly, that water to circulate around the island again, creating its original sensation, which I just is so cool to see, an island abbey once again. Arrive late in the day. This is one small destination with lots of people visiting it. Stay in one of the hotels we recommend, have dinner here, tour the abbey late in the day or first thing in the morning and have it not to yourself, but with far fewer crowds than get the heck out of Mont Saint-Michel before the tourist tide comes back in. Ah, Normandy. Now, Virginie is going to take us through the Loire Valley, which is south and east of the uh, of Normandy by about four hours. Take it away, madame. Yes, the Loire Valley has lots of different nicknames. It's been called the Valley of the Kings, the Valley of a Thousand Chateaux, the Garden of France, and for good reason. And this is also the birth of a French Renaissance. So this is where you're going to enjoy provincial uh, life and a relaxing vacation. Now, Amboise, the town that you have here, is a great base. That's the one we use on the Paris and the Heart of France tour uh, when you explore the eastern part of the Loire. It has two main sites, the castle that we saw earlier, which was the place uh, um, Francis I lived, the king of the Renaissance. And it's it's a quaint town, as you can see here, with enough restaurants, cafes, and hotels for you to use as a, as a great base. And the second big site is the Clos Lucé, which is where Leonardo da Vinci spent the last three uh, three years of his life. He was very close to the king, uh, Francis I. And behind this odd looking slingshot, you get to see the, the house where he lived that you can visit. And uh, inside the house and in the gardens, you have creation of what Leonardo had created on paper. So um, this is a great way to get into the, uh, get a good insight of the genius uh, of Leonardo da Vinci. Now, the Loire Valley is a fairly flat area peppered with castles. So this is a perfect place for biking. And especially now that you have electric bikes that are available almost everywhere. So don't hesitate to, uh, to do this, but 15 minutes away from Amboise, by car, not biking, uh, you get to Chenonceau. And Chenonceau is my favorite castles. Uh, I just love to call it my office when I'm on tour there. And um, this is the most visited castle of the Loire Valley. So even though you're outside of big city like Paris, you do need to plan to come early. And this is what happens when you leave ladies in charge, because there were seven ladies behind this castle. This is the one chateau that you can visit every single room. Uh, they will give you the, the history of how people lived, the, the, the noble lived when they lived in the Loire Valley. Another chateau, not too far away, but an hour from Amboise is Chambord. Now, this is completely different. This is not a feminine castle. This is a masculine castle. Uh, built as a hunting lodge for Francis I. It has over 400 rooms, I don't know how many uh, fireplaces and chimneys. Uh, on average, it's five times bigger than uh, a castle from the, um, from the Loire Valley. Now, what's most important about this castle is the architecture inside, not the furnished room. And what you see here is a double helix staircase, which uh, probably was designed by Leonardo da Vinci and then built, built there. Um, so this is at the eastern part of the Loire, and if you would like to go west of Tours, we, Tours is the big city in the area that divides the, the Loire into two different parts. Uh, on the Loire to the south of France, Tours, we stay in Chinon. Now, uh, you can see that there is another castle here. This is more a fortress compared to the leisure 
castle that we saw earlier. And this has a lot of history. Uh, Joan of Arc, Alienor of Aquitaine were ladies who stayed in the castle of Chinon. Now, with a thousand castles, you have to choose. You won't be able to see them all. And you could choose to go to Azelorido, which is a smaller castle, uh, a small jewel on a pond in a romantic English style garden surrounding it. Or you could decide to go to Villandry. Now, Villandry's focus is mainly the gardens. Uh, the interior is okay, but you go to the top of that tower and you have uh, quite a spectacular view over the French Renaissance style gardens. So see, you have to choose in, uh, in the Loire Valley where to go. And I hope I didn't castle you out because uh -huh. uh, there's plenty to see. And I know that Steve now is going to take you further south where there are other castles too, but you're going to talk about something else, I think. Yeah, thank thank you, Virginie. Good good overview of the Loire. Yeah, I love bike riding there. And as you said, it's level, and even with electric bikes, you can you can be lazy and still go from castle to castle with electric bikes these days. Becoming very popular. It's popular on the My Way tours that I do. This is my among my favorite regions in France. But I usually don't say that, but um, the Dor the Dordogne Valley. It offers a, a, a rich blend of, of natural and man-made beauty, I think like almost nowhere else in France. It is, uh, it's a remote place, kind of hard to get to, but well worth your effort. And the best way to experience this valley, uh, river valley, is by canoe, meandering down the slow moving river, stopping in villages like La Roque Gejac here. I recommend hotels, we recommend hotels here and touring castles like that, or stopping in, whoops, in Bainac, ending your canoe trip, about a two hour trip by canoe, stopping, you can visit several castles, but this is the best to see. Look at that castle towering above, below, well worth the sweat of walking up to it to tour the Richard the Lionhearted Castle of, this was the centerpiece between the Hundred Years War between the French and the Brits, all right. And uh, Rick liked this this tour so much, this, this canoe trip so much when we did it, like, God no, it was back when I had brown hair, that he created a self-guided tour of the float down the river complete with a map. I liked it so much that I think in the first France tour in 1992, I took my group down this uh, river, which Virginie, I, I think we still do today, do we? We still go on a canoe trip and uh, so far we haven't lost anybody. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to be uh, partnering with your with your spouse. You can be going with your buddy if you want. Uh, but this is this is a lot of fun. I really it's a highlight for me and for many people on that tour. I think. I think it is. Yeah, and it depends obviously on the level of the river, etc. But before going, so we're careful how we do that. I know. All right, and all right. Let's. Okay, I got to do this. There we go. The, uh, the best base probably, and I know this is where our tours, the Western France tour the, spends three nights here, and I love stopping for three nights, um, the, in Sarlat, S-A-R-L-A-T. This is, um, oh, it's it's a beautiful town of about 10,000 people, peppered with golden buildings and cobblestone lanes. There's no important site to visit on the inside, except for its twice a week market. This is its principal site. Arrive on a Tuesday or a Friday and wake up to the Place de la Liberté action here. The market gobbles up the entire Old Town, which is entirely pedestrian only except for one street, and see pungent and experienced truffles for sale, creamy foie gras, and saucisson that you're looking at here from everywhere in France. Goodness gracious, there are lots of sausages in France for sale. We do a self-guided tour in the book of the market, and it's great fun. But the Dordogne is probably most famous as the location with the greatest concentration of prehistoric artifacts anywhere. Um, here you can trace back 20 to 30,000 years ago, guys, when woolly mammoths and saber-toothed cats roamed the earth, cavemen dug deep inside caverns like this and painted animals with remarkable accuracy and beauty that you can experience in the Dordogne Valley. Seeing original cave art from 30,000 years ago is mind boggling. This is a scene of horses running and reindeer from the uh, caves at Lascaux, the world's most famous caves, about 30,000 years ago. These are copycat caves because you can no longer tour the interior, yet they have been done painstakingly pr with perfection. And it makes a great first stop for any, for travelers who are serious prehistorians, because not only do you get a tour in English, it's busy place, so book it ahead, like most of these caves. And you not you also get an interpretive center, which sets the stage for the original cave art that you, you might visit 
uh, in other places, such as, I love this rhinoceros, at the caves of Rufignac. I love this place. And I know Virginie leads the tours here where we ride a clunky little train half a mile up a, down a cavern so we don't have to walk it. And we see ex really exquisitely uh, drawn, black and white mostly paintings, uh, drawings of rhinoceros, woolly mammoths, bears, and even see bear scratches, I think, as you go down this cave from their claws of hibernating in the wintertime. Rufignac here doesn't require reservations. It's about the only cave we list that doesn't. Be first in line. Arrive about half an hour before it opens and you'll do fine. Right, An hour south of the Dordogne Valley, almost to the Mediterranean, lies this town of turrets and towers that we call Carcassonne, Europe's greatest fortified walled fortress. And again, much like Mont Saint-Michel, this is one busy destination. Arrive late, check into a hotel like the one we stay at on our tour here, or any one of a number that we list with great views of the wall. Arrive late in the day, have a Dinner, a light dinner, a, a, not, not something for somebody on a diet, a, an old Roman concoction called cassoulet of pork, sausage, mutton, white beans, and, and you name it, and then get out and walk off that dinner of cassoulet. Boy, I mean, if I only saw Carcassonne at night, I would be perfectly happy. It is the, the lighting that the French do anywhere you go, it seems. Even my little village on, on in Burgundy is just lovely. And this is no exception. Wake up in the morning and tour the interior castle. This is a chateau within the fortified walls. And then get out of there, much like Le Mont Saint-Michel by 11 o'clock. And Virginie is going to take us through the region due east by a couple of hours in Provence. Provence, yes, everybody knows about Provence, the land of marvelous and colorful landscapes. It's almost constant sunshine, so it makes it for a pretty neat destination for uh, great food and great wine. It's lots of small villages and some great towns, and I'd like to take you first to Arles, uh, which is where we uh, stay on the Loire to the south of France tour. And Arles is a great base to explore Provence and to learn about the Roman world. Um, we have two sites that you see here, the, the big arena in the middle and then a little bit to the left, the theater. So I would say, first go to the, 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 the museum and the museum gives you a, a good explanation of how this was built and how important the city was when actually 2000 years ago, it was the population was bigger than what it is today. Uh, it has very nice models of the different Roman buildings for you to understand them better, such as a theater here. And then afterwards, you get to walk in the city and explore those monuments and see how they are used 2000 years after. Now in, in Provence, they have bull shows that are different from Spanish uh, bullfight. This is more like a circus where the hero of the game is actually, actually the bull. And uh, Arles is, is just, you can walk everywhere in Arles. There is outdoor seating. Uh, this is where you slow down. This is what Provence is all about. We actually have a big difference between Northern France and Southern France. And in Southern France, you just get to relax. And then you get to walk in the footstep of Van Gogh that you see here. Uh, this is where he was inspired, where he got all of the inspiration from the sunshine and the colors of Provence. And the town of Arles has a lot of easels uh, showing you where he actually painted those uh, famous uh, pieces of art, such as the um, Café Terrasse at night here. And so you can follow this. We have uh, most of those easels in, in the guidebook. Now, 15 minutes away from Arles, we have the small uh, Cliff Hill village of Les Beaux de Provence, one of the most beautiful villages of France. And if you look at the top left corner, you see people standing on top of the ruin of the castle, and they're enjoying some dramatic views over a field of olive trees and the small Alpi mountains and views of the Mediterranean Sea. So this is what Provence is all about. But you could also decide to stay in a different town. Uh, a bit further north is Avignon. Uh, this is where the France My Way tour stays. And it's a great base if you have no car because it has great uh, bus and train transportation. Now, the history of Avignon is not as old as the history of, uh, of Arles, if I may say, but in the 1300, this became the new Vatican. This is where uh, over a century, we had seven popes residing in Avignon in that palace. Now, uh, it's a thriving city today. Uh, no major site aside from the, the palace, but lots of sprawling um, uh, 
uh, squares like this one where again you can enjoy the life of Provence. And from Avignon, it's an easy trip to the Pont du Gard. And we're back to this major Roman site. I think it's it has to be the, the best rune that we have uh, uh, in uh, all of our friends. It's part of a 30 mile long aqueduct where 90% of the aqueduct is either on ground level or underground. And then they have this massive part which is just uh, above water and is still, um, still standing today. Now, there is something super exciting that I love to do is uh, with our group, we get to walk. If you look at the third level of the arches there, uh, on top is where the water used to flow. And they had to have the perfect slope to bring the water from the spring of Uzes to the big city of Nîmes. And today with our group, we get to walk inside that canal. Uh, I think, but but I'm always jealous of Steve because he always tell me about this cool story, which I guess I'm a bit younger, so I never got to do it. Ah, tell yeah. us, Steve. Ouch, that hurts. I'm going back to this one because I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, you could walk across the top of that narrow expanse. There are no guardrails there. Uh, it's 900, it's 2000 years old. It's the windiest part of France. And there's no sign suggesting maybe you shouldn't be doing this. Seriously, uh, for your viewers, the last time I did this, and this may have what caused them to close it now, you can't do it anymore. I saw a mountain biker bike across that. Seriously. But now, as you say, Virginie, oh, nuts, I meant to share a screen. Oh, well, now you can walk right through the center of it. And I think that's cool that we do it on our tours. It's it's very safe today, so no problem. And north of Provence, we have the Côte du Rhône. So maybe some of you are drinking Côte du Rhône wine uh, tonight, uh, the famous wine region. And this is a perfect place to hire a, a local guide uh, to help you understand what may appear to many North American as a complex system of French wine, because we don't call wine by the uh, by the grape varietal, but by the region. And so we have local guides such as Mike, who's going to explain everything to you and make uh, make what may be daunting uh, experience of tasting wine actually a, a fun experience. Now, the small town of Vaison la Romaine, where we stay on the best of Eastern France tour, is. Um, I, I love this place. Now, look at the the, st the steeple of the, cath the old cathedral right in the middle, and you go down a little bit on the slide, and you see a, a blue sign. Uh, I know what it says there, Le Beffroi. This is where most of the groups on the Best of Eastern France tour stay. Now, for most Americans, you would consider, their, consider this to be old town. But in French standard, this is not old town. It's only from the, you know, 1200 you go down to the river level and you have a town which is 2,000 years old. Um, this is like a mini Pompeii uh, where we have actually the ruins and then where the people live today. The 20th century town was actually built on top of the ruins and uh, you get to explore this. So this is, this is quite special to stay in Vaison la Romaine, I believe. And uh, a half hour from Vaison, we have another monumental site this is the theater of Orange. Now this photo is, is a bit old, but I love it because uh, cars cannot park there anymore, but it gives you a good scale of the size of this stage wall. It's the best preserved stage wall that we have in uh, all over Europe from, uh, from the Roman time. Um, to finish our Provence uh, journey, we can then go to Aix-en-Provence. Now, Aix-en-Provence is, is a bigger city and it has a city feel where you can enjoy what the French call the art de vivre, the art of living. And um, it has stylish cafe, lots of nice restaurants, trendy shops, and uh, and you can enter a farmer's market, you know, different farmer's market almost every day of the week to enjoy the colors, flavors, and uh, smell of Provence. Now, no big museums in Aix-en-Provence. However, this is where uh, Cézanne, Paul Cézanne lived and where he painted uh, lots of his uh, main art. And for example, here, the Montagne Sainte Victoire. And I think it's a great way uh, to, uh, to enjoy the beauty of Provence through his paintings. So uh, this was the inland part of uh, the southeast of France. And Steve is going to take us to the Med, I think now, right? Darn right, I am. Just just a few hours east of Aix-en-Provence, which, by the way, is near Marseille, a great city to visit sometime if you have time. That's covered in our Provence book. 
But here on the French Riviera, the capital city of Nice, the fifth largest in France, here you can, and this this is a terrific city. Um, Rick and I spent eight days here in May. We met you here, I, I remember Virginie, updating our guidebooks. And we, we love, it's a city that I used to really not like going to, but today, today you can take the escalator up to this Castle Hill here and have this grand view of the Bay des Anges, the, the Bay of the Angels and scope out your plan for the day. Tour, wander the Promenade des Anglais, which lines that all those palm trees you see right on the water down, down there below. It's like a playground along the pebbly beaches. There are bike lanes that allow you to ride from one end to the other. It's a fun place to bike ride, ro roller skate, or really best just stroll and find a bench or a blue chair and hang out and watch the French at play. If you look along, you'll see these little blue and yellow uh, white umbrellas. There are several cafes right on the beach where you can have breakfast, a coffee, a beer, lunch, or dinner. That's a great way. That's a very French way to appreciate the Riviera. But there's much more to Nice than the beaches. And that's something important to understand. And one reason I love this city so much today are, is the new tram system. They have three lines in now and they're building more. All the tram lines erased cars from squares like this, the Place Massena, which is really the centerpiece in Nice, which connects the old city with the new city. And here, there used to be cars circling around this uh, this square. And now all you see, there's no cars. It's a tram and lots of pedestrians. It's beautiful. The Plasma Sena is gorgeous at night. I love this. And speaking of old Nice, which it connects to the new city, here in this Italian-influenced area, you'd swear you were in Italy, wandering the old streets of Nice, where we recommend, and I think we've had some good meals here. Uh, I love. I just love having dinner in the old city. There's no important site, oh, to go into in the old city other than exploring its old italian lanes and enjoying a meal or a, a gelato, for example, on the street, and enjoying the market. The Cour Salle has market every day of the week, but Monday... And pick, pick up your picnic for the day. Get some soca and enjoy the local scene. Nice is has a full palette of museums for any museum goer. And the Riviera has museums dedicated to artists such as my favorite here, Marc Chagall, which uh, Rick has done a terrific self-guided tour to. Um, but there's also a museum dedicated to Henri Matisse and further along Pablo Picasso in nearby Antibes or Fernand Léger or Raoul Dufy or Auguste Renoir. You can enjoy contemporary modern, uh, art lovers. The Riviera is a phenomenal place to visit. Nice is surrounded by memorable day trips. Just over that hill there and around 10 minutes from Nice is this little pastel colored village of Villefranche-sur-Mer. Many people prefer making this their home base and then day tripping into the big city of Nice. Um, here, uh, these pastel buildings with steep narrow lanes that spill down into the water below. Um, uh, allow travelers to have a quieter, enjoyable visit to the to the French Riviera. This is maybe more what they were looking for. N right next to, around the bay from Nice, lies the Cap Ferrat with the greatest seaside walks in, in, in this region. And notice how the Alps, the mountains you see right there, spill right down into the Mediterranean. Here, the Alps, you can take a, you could ski until recently, if the snow's good enough, within an hour and a half of Nice. Incredible. All right. A little bit further east of Nice is the tiny minuscule principality of Monaco, a principality that's only three quarters of a mile square. You're looking at all of it in this image right now. That's the principality right there. And there's three neighborhoods to enjoy in, in Monaco, which is astonishing, by the way, because it's managed to remain independent since the 1200s. Incredible. You're looking into Italy, by the way. You, it's so close you can taste the pesto, right? Anyway, there's three neighborhoods. We're standing in uh, Monacoville. You're looking down on the port where since 1929, cars have raced around its harbor in the most famous race I know of, the Grand Prix of Monaco. And on the other hill on the other side, you can't quite make it out, is the neighborhood of Monte Carlo where the famous casino lies. Now arrive by noon and enjoy the changing of the guard in this uh, adorable little minuscule country. This is a nostalgic event and, and almost humorous because there are more people in the Philharmonic in uh, in Monaco than there are in its military. Still, it's a great event to enjoy. Um, and also, you'll get a sense of the glamorous relationship between American great actress Grace Kelly and Prince Rainier, who lived in this palace for a long period of time and whose son occupies it, Prince Albert, today. 
by touring the palace. Nearby, just a walk away from that palace in Monacoville, is the aquarium that Jacques Cousteau made famous, featuring fish from the Mediterranean. It's well worth your time, with, particularly if you're traveling with kids. Uh, a short bus ride away or about a half an hour walk down by that port that I showed you and up the hill on the other side in the neighborhood of Monte Carlo sits the world's most famous casino. Here you can tour it in the morning on your own without worrying about gamblers at your side, maybe some slot machines, or come back in the afternoon and gamble away your kids' inheritance. It makes a great day trip from Nice. And by the way, the casino is truly magnificent at night. And it is fun to go in and pay the, I don't know, 10 euros or whatever it is. And don't even gamble, just enjoy the interior. And But you got to wear something nice that looks good on you and feel like James Bond, I always feel. All right, take us to the mountains now, Virginie. I'm trying to speed us along. Let's go north right into the teeth of the Alps. What do you say? So the French Alps, what the French call the Savoie region, which is the border with uh, Italy and Switzerland. And on this blue lake, you have the town of Annecy, which is a, with a lovely old town uh, with lots of canals, walkways. And all along the, the lake, you have uh, almost all along the, the lake, you have a bike lane. So it's a very sporty, um, sporty town with great vistas. Now you can go on a boat cruise to enjoy those views. Or you can decide, uh, so that's what we do on one of the tours, we use uh, the, the boat to, uh, to uh, explore the lake. Or you can decide to use it as a shuttle, you know, put your bike on the boat, go from one village to another, hop on and, and hop off if you want. And then you can put some uh, pretty uh, heavy hiking in this area. Uh, there are lots of villages. And for example, I know this is Steve's favorite hike from the bottom to the top in the village of Taloir. It's about a 40 minute uh, hike. And my favorite hike is just, just across, but this is a uh, perfect land for hiking. But an hour and a half away, we are in the very high Alps, uh, the birthplace of mountaineering, the place where we had the first winter Olympic games in 1924, the town of Chamonix. Now Chamonix has two seasons for uh, tourism. You have a long summer, where you're going to have some of the, the greatest uh, hiking. And then if you want to be thrilled by, by the Alps, then you can come in the winter time here. Now, I want to tell you about my perfect day in the Alps. On the best of Eastern France tour, we have a vacation from your vacation. There is a full day where you do whatever you want. And I would say, you know, from it's go early, take the cable car to the Aiguille du Midi, and you'll be at 13,000 feet in this perfect complex with restaurant terraces, uh, history of mountaineering that lets you enjoy this, you know, being on the top of the world. That's really the feeling that you have when you have those peaks surrounding you, you're on top of the world. And then you have two options. Either you want to experience the, the best border crossing ever by being into these small dangling uh, gondolas that will take you in 45 minutes over a huge glacier to Italy, spend some time in Italy and then come back. Or if you prefer to go hiking, uh, we list several hikes in the guidebook. And my favorite one is hike number one. You're just above the tree line and you have views on the peaks and on the Mont Blanc, that big, big mountain. And then at the end of about you know three four hours, depending how fast or slow you are, uh, you arrive at the Mer de Glace. Now the Mer de Glace is uh, even though it's receding, it's still a, a pretty big glacier, and uh, you can actually go into the the ice. And after you're done with this, you go back on the cogwheel train that you see here and make your way back to Chamonix. Now mm -hmm. of course. Being in Chamonix after so much oxygen, so much workout, it's time to experience the local specialty. And that's one of them is fondue. Th this is cheese, cheese, and more cheese when you are <laughs> in Chamonix, uh, Chamonix area. But that's what France is all about, right? Food, isn't it, Steve? Yes. And now we're going to make our way uh, north. And we're going to Burgundy. So a few hours north from the Alps, uh, the rural region of Burgundy, which may have the best food uh, of France, right? And I'm not saying that because I adopted this region as uh, Steve did. I think this is your village, Steve, on the Canal de Bourgogne, right? That's right. Yeah. That we, yeah. And I, I live an hour and an hour away in the in the Puy Fuissé area. Maybe some of you know the Puy Fuissé wine. Now. Bonn is the perfect town where you will really feel at ease, 
uh, at ease, sorry. Uh, it's a capital of Burgundy wine. Talking about that, I haven't seen Steve uh, drinking a lot. I, I'm, try, I'm doing my best. <laughs> I'm doing oh, my best. Doing best. I'm not. Okay. So uh, it has lots of cafe, restaurant, of course, lots of wine bars. And the town of Beaune has one main historical site, the Hotel Dieu, which is the old medieval charity uh, hospital that you can visit. Um, now, you have to plan your visit to Beaune to be there on a Saturday morning because uh, there are lots of farmers market in France, but Burgundy is famous for its food and its Saturday morning market. It's quite exceptional. It's crawled outside and on the left-hand side here under the covered marketplace. And then in the evening, like many towns in France, we've told you already, it's beautifully lit at night. So this is a good way to enjoy French life. Have your dinner. And I know that for many Americans, you believe that we eat too much and we eat too late. But you can <laughs> have a seven seven o'clock dinner works and then you can uh, burn out the calories by walking uh, into bone and seeing uh, several facades that are that have beautiful uh, light show like this one now bone is a great base because north and south of bone you have the route des vins where you have those beautiful vineyards on the hillside uh, with those small villages and the name of the villages are actually names of wines and so you can explore on bikes. I know this is um, some of the, the places that Steve has been uh, biking through. And I love to do that, I, especially when it's uh, uh, harvest time and you, you bike in the, in the vineyards and you hear all of those languages. Is that your favorite time, Steve, to go there, biking? It, um, yeah, it's more importantly, I mean, those vineyards are so manicured in Burgundy. They, and all those, the, the, the wine service lanes make de facto bike paths. Um, and along the Burgundy Canal, there's the towpath that you can bike forever. It's really, I think, the best region in France for biking. It's just marvelous. And I can never get enough of it, it seems like. You should uh, say the best region of, of France, period, right? <laughs> yes. Let's go. There we go. So the Route des Vins. And then you're going to have lots of different castles because before Burgundy became part of France, it was actually wealthier and more powerful uh, than France itself. So you're going to have a lot of castles and I love it on the best of Eastern France tour. We have a private visit to this castle, the Chateau de Ruy, and we actually get to meet a count. That in case you didn't know, we still have some people with titles in France and you get to meet a cool guy. This is Raoul, Count Raoul on the left hand side. And he takes us into his home and explains how you live in the 21st century in a, in a medieval castle. Um, talking about castle, because Burgundy is big. I know I was going to tell you about a place that I've been visiting for 10 years, but you've been there for a much longer time, right? This is one of the most remarkable. Thank you for, for letting me talk about this. I mean, officially in Burgundy, I guess it's really nowhere in France in many ways. Get alone, it well justifies the big tour to get get there. Here they're building with only materials and tools from the 1200s, an exact replica of a castle designed in the year 1200. Again, just using tools and techniques from that area. I started seeing this when it was just a quarry, you guys. Um, and I, in fact, I, Julie Sanvo, who's one of the one of our great France guides, was a local guide here. And that's how I hired her. She was the first guide I had here. And now this wall, I mean, every year it gets a bit bigger. It's a 40 year project, 40 years to build a castle in the style with you, the materials. And it's it, it was designed to be an exploratory project to understand how these castles were built. So after all the castles we've shown you, how great to understand best what it looks like and, and understand how they uh, built it in those days. Um, God, I love that. Three hours north is the beautiful region of Alsace, the, that area um, bounded by, uh, by the Rhine River to the east by about five miles from where I'm standing here taking this picture, and to the west by these soft Vosges mountains. It's a land of beautiful villages, Hansel and Greta villages that I mentioned before, like Rickvier here or Egesheim. Just absolutely adorable geranium draped villages, ideal for pedestrians and wine tasting. This is a part of France, like I think the Provence region, where you are so welcome as, as a taster because they're trying to get their wines better known in other countries, particularly the United States. And this is an image of, of a tour, of a guide on the tour that I led this year of Eastern France. Um, and it's easy though for individuals and independent travelers to taste, a friendly place in those villages. Colmar makes 
the best base, I think, for touring this region. It's a city of about 80,000 people with just lovely, extensive pedestrian-only lanes, beautifully lit at night. One more time, this city, have dinner, and always assume you're going to go out for a beautiful walk after dinner. Because darn, those French know how to make a city beautiful. But Comar is more than a good base. It has a, a, a heavyweight sites of its own. Principal which is the Unterlinden Museum here. Once a once a, an abbey, it was um, home. Now it's home. It's a home to a uh, fine arts museum with art from the Roman era to modern days. But its highlight is the Isenheim altarpiece that you're looking at here. Um, this painting by Matthias Grunewald highlights. It's five panels that are open on different feast days of the year, and it was designed for people suffering from disease that we call today rye ergotism in the Middle Ages. Well, this was painted in the early 1500s. And you can see the graphic, almost surreal uh, painting, a, a most unusual image of Christ on the cross because it was designed to make people understand that Christ understood their suffering while they laid in their beds and stared at this image. The, the Unterlin Museum is one of the great sites in Colmar, as is the Bartoli Museum. The guy from France, hometown boy, who built, who sculpted the Statue of Liberty, but also did so many other great works of art, statues, and sculptures that you'll find in squares throughout the country of France. I love the museum. Even if you didn't do the Statue of Liberty, the Bartoli Museum is well worth a visit. All right, you're very far east in France, but halfway back to Paris when we'll end this visit lie the uh, most powerful battlefields I've visited. The battlefields at Verdun, dedicated to World War I, where over 300,000 people would die uh, in less than a year in this war that was designed to, what they thought would end all wars. Here you can tour the Ossuaire and its cemetery and imagine and understand through museums and displays the misery that soldiers in World War I suffered from. Today, you can visit some of the trenches, but most are, are covered over, of course, after all this time by change in land form. And the good news after visiting, the sad thing about Verdun, I think, is that it's so little vis visited. Um, I, it's just not a happy sight for people, but it's powerfully important to understand, I think. An hour further west toward Paris lie the beautiful and more northerly vineyards of Champagne in this region of France. Yes, Champagne. We do a self-guided tour. I love my self-guided tour of the vineyards of, of Champagne because most people stay in Reims or Epernay, but get out and see the small villages that produce great Champagnes, then stay maybe in Reims. This is like Nice to me, a city that I used to really not care much about, but it was important to cover in the book, so I did it. But now, thanks to tramways again and squares like, this is this is taken from our hotel on the square where we start our Eastern France tours, by the way. Uh, thanks to trams like this and pedestrian lanes, you can enjoy this. I can enjoy the city of Reims like I never did before. Here, the, one of the most famous, maybe arguably the most famous cathedral in France. It is brilliant. In, it's famous because here, since the 800s, all the kings of France were coronated, taken to Reims and coronated in this very historic Gothic cathedral. France has, Reims, has it, right, but it's spelled R-E-I-M-S in rhymes with France. Um, there are more, there are more other, several, a variety of other sites. Uh, I love this one. This, these are the war rooms or the surrender rooms where in, on May 7th, 1945, Dwight Eisenhower accepted the unconditional surrender of the German forces. And it's a, it's a, uh, oh, there's a lot of artifacts and things to see in the, in the war rooms, but most importantly is the table, what you're looking at right now, where they signed the treaty. Right, it's a great way to end any trip to France uh, and Champagne in this region with maybe a Champagne cave tasting and tour. While these are expensive, by the way, I'll warn you: if you want to go to Piper Heidsick or Bove Clico or Mum or Tatanger, expect to pay a fair price and get a small tasting. But hey, how many times are you in Champagne, right? And the tours are really well done. You'll learn a lot about the history, the um, remarkable history of Champagne and get a little tasting at the end. Well, there you go. All of these sites that Virginie and I have had to hustle through tonight. Thank you for your patience with our speed. We cover on our tours, whether it's Paris City Week or Paris in the Heart of France tour in 11 days, or the Western France tour, as I call it, the Loire to the South of France tour that Virginia noted so many times. Starts in Chartres, covers the Loire Valley, the Dordogne, Carcassonne, Arles, and Nice. That's a great itinerary. Then her favorite, maybe, I think, 
she's kind of torn between the Eastern France tour, what used to be vineyards and villages, starting in the Champagne country that we just visited, staying in, uh, passing through Verdun, spending three hours in Verdun, doing a good job there, going to the Alsace in Colmar, Burgundy, uh, high Alps at Chamonix and ending in the Provence region with Baison La Romaine and Exxon Provence. And the My Way tours that I get to do because boy, I can get a lot of good researching done with people who take these tours. They're so independently oriented. I love this tour. It's a bit of a mix of all the other tours in 13 days. All right. And he, and on our tours, you know, here's what we include. And you can read this on our website more than I should spend time reading this list to you now. The important things are 24 people to 28 uh, all tips, no tipping allowed, everything's included that that on the tour sightseeing wise that we do together. About half your dinners, a few lunches usually, and all breakfasts are covered on the tours that we offer. Reminder, uh, pay attention. You may win a city tour. You got to go to Paris, although I like the other cities. <laughs> and another reminder that if you sign up for a tour with by February 5th, you can save $100 a person. And speaking for all of our guides, to all of you who've stayed with Virginie and I tonight, thank you. Thank you. And we hope that we, you'll join us somewhere and allow us to turn you on to the countries that we are so passionate about and will help turn you on and embrace the cultures that you came to visit. And a particular thanks to my dear friend and almost neighbor in Burgundy, uh, Virginie Marais. Virginie, it's what time? 3.30 in the morning, your time? Um, it's four o'clock. It's four o'clock right now, oh but I'm God. having fun, right? I you are to... a rock star. You are a lovely person, and I thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Steve. This was fun. All right. And thank you to all of you who will travel to France because of those waiters and because of how friendly those French people are in spite of what you may have been told. Merci tout le monde. Hello. I'm so glad that you ended with that picture because there are many, many questions tonight. People were so thankful and complimentary about both of you and for sharing your knowledge. Um, but there were a couple of themes that came out. So since you showed that picture, I'll start with, with the first one. Uh, Franco-American relationships. Some people have heard that the French are rude or judgmental and they think Americans are ignorant. Um, uh, and another woman said, you know, the best part of traveling in France has been the friendly people, but is increasing tourism straining that? So please, if you would both address this, I'd love it so much. Go ahead, Virginie. Yes, I always start my tours by telling people that the French are a formal culture. Mm -hmm. And I learned it the hard way when I moved back to France. After 11 years in the U.S., two years in England, I forgot one day to say bonjour when I was addressing a stranger <laughs> in the street. And the lady looked at me, so I asked very politely, excusez-moi, madame, s'il vous plaît, where is? And the lady looked at me and said, bonjour. And I thought I was the worst person in the world. We are just, you know, they're just keys to any culture. And in French, we're formal. We, we teach two years old kids to actually say bonjour and be super polite. So if you as an adult arrive and start being very efficient in your culture and just start asking what you want. This is not how it works in France. And as long as you're just not smiling too much, but you're using the right keywords, people are going to be nice. I mean, even in Paris, it's a big city like New York, but people are very helpful. How many times did I have people telling me, you know, I just pulled out my map and a young French person arrived and helped me just to figure out the metro or anything like this. So. It's a stereotype which is based on the fact that we are formal indeed, but if you if you use the right words, then people are nice. I, I, how many times in the US people tell me, you're not French, you're nice. And it's like, <laughs> we're nice people. <laughs> I think adding to Virginie, first of all, the good lesson is always start anything with bonjour, madame, bonjour, monsieur. That's a great way to break the ice. They don't really expect you to have know all the perfect mannerisms. But also every tour I've done, Virginie, and I've done a few of them in my 40 years here, every tour member is always surprised at how nice the French are. It's not because I'm introducing them. They're on their own a lot, as you know. So what you have to do is go to a country and realize that the people aren't these stereotypes, right? Absolutely. I always tell my tour members that you must treat a French person as a human being first before you get down to business, because we as Americans want to be efficient, just like Virginie says, and we don't want to waste their time. They're doing us a favor by helping us. 
but you acknowledge them as a person first and then then you get down to business so second yeah. theme the olympics mm -hmm. so how is that going to train change transportation in paris and should people even go to paris during this time if they're not going for the olympics how far out will it bleed into the countryside thoughts um i'll start on this one um um, the Olympics are famous, by the way, and I have some experience with this for for actually drops in tourism to the key sites. Now, people want to go to the Olympics and during the Olympics, they'll see the site, they'll see the games, etc. But I believe and hotels will be slammed for sure during the Olympics, they'll be slammed. But in an Olympic year, you'll find I bet France in general tourism is down. That's that's the history of Olympics in Greece or wherever they've been. Um, Outside of Paris, I bet it's quiet. They're going to focus on Paris. And inside of Paris, I bet the Louvre and even Versailles are better this year because people will be watching the games and not touring those sites. What do you think, Madame Virginie? I think it's a good opportunity. I mean, you'll go to Paris, spend maybe a couple of days. It's a good opportunity to experience what France is all about. It's, it's not just the big cities. It's the beautiful countryside, small villages we've shown you tonight. And the Olympic Games won't be there. And there might be even less people there, as you said. And Lisa, can I add something? I realized I had a major gap or uh, faux pas. I didn't mention that this is also the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings, which I should have done during that talk, but I was trying to catch up on time. That will make the D-Day beaches a mess for travelers, although it's a marvelous time to be there a week before, uh, four days before, or three days after June 6th. Otherwise, the D-Day beaches are totally quiet and fine. So don't worry that, that that doesn't spill over either beyond just right around June 6th. That said, if you can go during that time, it's pretty exciting to see the events that happen there. And there's a time where the French, and a place where the French love Americans. Oh, that sounds wonderful. I would love to be there at that time. Okay, uh, another question is, how is the rebuilding of Notre Dame going? Maybe you mentioned this a little bit and I didn't hear everything, but um, people in the chat were also mentioning that they're using artisans and craftspeople that are trained at Gedelon to help rebuild Notre Dame. So uh, I heard that somebody said that Notre Dame was gonna be open by this summer, but what's the latest? So, the the latest is actually December 8, which is an important day for Mary. Uh, that's when it will reopen. We don't know yet exactly how it will be reopened. It will be like before where we had a line to go through. Uh, the steeple will be visible by this summer, so by the Olympic Games. Uh, but it's supposed to reopen now. Steve and I had the chance to experience something great. So if you go before it's reopened or if the lines are too long, you can still see the cathedral and just uh, under the, the big esplanade in front, what used to be a parking lot has been transformed into a uh, virtual reality tour. And you spend 45 minutes going through the history of Notre Dame. And it's, it's just, you get face to face with how they build the stained glass windows. And your guide is a, an architect from the, well, a mason from the middle ages. So until it reopens in 2024, there's still uh, lots of way to enjoy Notre Dame differently. That's such what a do you good think? Insight. Good call, Virginie. And I hope they continue it well after the, the cathedral opens, who knows? But it is, and I'm skeptical of those uh, virtual reality things. And this one was astonishing. Have you seen it, Lise? I can't remember, did you go? Yeah. Yes, I did it this year. It was amazing. I You could hear the raindrops and you could almost feel them. It was just like stepping back in time. I thought it was and so it, well done. It's listed in our book too, if, if readers wanna know. It's it's well described in the book, thanks to Virginie's research, yeah. I think until Notre Dame reopens, it's it's just a good way because you you, you step in the cathedral and yep. it's, it's quite yep. neat, you know. So um, there were also two questions about winter travel. So Elise wanted to know if the markets run in the winter season or if they move inside. And Rebecca wanted to know if smaller towns like Villefranche-sur-Mer or Antibes close down completely in the winter. It's a two-part question. You want to start the markets, madam, and then I'll take the second part? So the markets are all year round. They are not made for tourists. They are made for French people who love going to the market. And they, you know, there is one Costco in France, in the outskirts of Paris. People don't shop at Costco. They don't buy 
so much stuff. So it's, it's, I mean, it's great for tourists to enjoy, but this is actually made for the locals. So it's all year round. Yes. It's a really good point. And one of the reasons people don't shop at Costco's is they don't have room in their houses to store all that stuff that we do as Americans. Their refrigerators are a tiny fraction of the size of ours, et cetera. So they need the markets, right? Yep. What was this? Oh, the second part. Oh, I would in a heartbeat go to Villefranche and Antibes in the winter. Are you kidding me? Absolutely. Great idea. Otherwise, though, a lot of that stuff outside of Paris and Nice and the big cities in the winter is pretty darn quiet. Uh, you'll find pretty sleepy towns. Stick to the main towns or the Riviera, I think. Don't you think, Virginia? And you'll do fine. Okay, this is a question that I know is right up both of your alleys. So Jennifer wants to know, if we love the outdoors and have already enjoyed the Alps, the Pyrenees, and the Gorge du Verdun, what other gems should we explore in France? The Alps, the Pyrenees, uh -huh. and the Gorge du Verdun. Wow, they've done a lot. The Ardèche. Oh, good call. Yeah. Uh, region for me. The Ardèche is a couple of hours north, uh, south of Lyon, and mm -hmm. it has almost no people. At, at, until the 1970s, there was no road. So you just had trails where goats, you know, uh, wild goats were, were just there. And they built a road in the 70s just along the gorge, beautiful uh, gorge. And um, it's still you know, not very traveled. And it's beautiful hiking, nice scenery. They have a, um, a prehistoric site that was uh, open, open yeah. uh, nine, 2014, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, replica of, of a cave, yeah. Uh, that's a good call. I also, that's a good traveler. Whoever that is, I'd, li I'd like to meet that person because mm -hmm. I share, and I know Virginie, we are, we love the outdoors. I love the Gorge du Tarn, T-A-R-N. Mm -hmm. Take a look at that. I used to include that in the book, but had to reduce pages. But I like your suggestion also. And the Ardèche is not far away, but focus on that part of France. Um, canoes, kayaks on the Gorge de Tarn as well. And good hiking. And I must add also this year you sent me, I did the research and I drove from the Dordogne area to the Loire doing book research. And I went into the lot, L-O-T. Oh yeah, yeah, it's beautiful, yeah. I just felt, this was June, there was almost nobody. And I, I just felt it was bad that you only gave me four days there. <laughs> I know, I did. <laughs> like three weeks hiking, going place. So the lot, L-O-T. So that's yep. a south. Yeah. Virginie, I really thought you were gonna tell me about the pink granite coast in Brittany. <laughs> that's I true. Well, yeah, I was thinking hiking. Well, you could do what we call in Brittany the Trop Braise. So I'm from Brittany, and the Trop Braise means the tour of Brittany, where we have uh, the old uh, custom trail um, all along the coast of Brittany. You can walk this. And this, yeah, but you know, just Brittany is in my heart. It's not so visited. So maybe that's why I don't talk too much about it because I want to keep it just for myself. I don't know. So I can maybe add that's that why to what she's saying. Throughout France, there, there's what they call the GR trail. GR stands for Grand Randonnée. Through Burgundy, through anywhere, great. And there's good information on those trails. People walk them for weeks or days at a time. And that includes good information on uh, accommodations along the trails, et cetera. I've ridden them on my mountain bike a couple of times too and done some of the walking. But there's, I think it's almost limitless in France. Don't you think, Virginie? The, the GR yeah, system? And, uh, the, the biggest one is the Corsica. If you want to hike all of Corsica, you can go south to north in Corsica, north to south hiking, yeah. Okay, we hit that one pretty well, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you need a car to travel in France or do the trains go everywhere? Okay, I, why don't I, this is, well, a car helps, certainly, but you don't need one. Uh, we do the research, we do it half year, but one part by car, one part by train. Uh, Virginia's done both too as well. Um, you can, you just have to have patience and probably limit your expectations of every place you're going to get to. Here's where all the minivan tours and local guides come in so handy though. And every region in France that we cover, we list great local guides in these little minivans to take you to those places that, are, that you'd want a car for. It's such a pleasure not to have to mess with a car, isn't it Virginie, when you're doing research? Yeah, yeah, it's true that you can work in the train. It's quite handy not to have to drive. But I would say that, you know, when you think about the U.S., you have a lot of big cities. In France, you have Paris, then you have Lyon and Marseille, and then any other city, I mean, that you, I'm thinking of Orange right now, because we were talking about Orange Theater earlier. 
it's small for American standards and there's a train going there and several times a day. So it's just a different perspective from your train travel in the States, which is it, not very existent, right? It, she makes a really good point though. And, and I should have said, it is a very rural country compared to Spain or Italy, where a lot of your destinations are big cities. So trains work really well there. A car is darn handy. I don't want to pretend that it's not for getting around. As a follow-up question, I'm going to do two more questions. Um, Robin wants to know, can you day trip from Paris to the D-Day beaches or should you stay overnight? Oh, I would stay overnight. That's a long, you can. The, the right answer is you can. And the way to do it, by the way, is you take the bullet train to Caen, C-A-E-N, and start your tour there. You can hire a guide service or a taxi service from there. Bayeux that I described is just another further, yeah, you can start there as well, but it's just a little bit further away. It makes, you're going to spend um, seven hours, probably six, seven hours on the trains that one day. Uh, but but sleeping on the beaches, I didn't mention this in my talk, but we list hotels right in Aromash, right on the water. That with one night, with one night, that's where I'd stay and sleep right mm -hmm. there at the artificial harbor. Here's your knee. Yeah, you get to see the tides and, you know, you arrive at high tide, let's say. And then you don't see the artificial harbor. And then six hours later, you just feel like, you know, 75 years ago. Just, yeah. Here's the problem, well, eight, in France, uh, Lisa, is that their technological accomplishment with the bullet train system, which is the greatest in Europe, can allows this kind of day tripping to the Loire Valley. You can tour the Chateau of the Loire. You could go to Mont Saint-Michel. They'd be crazy, but you can do it in a day trip as well. Because You can tour Bone, all these places because of this 220 mile an hour speed trains that allow you to do it. But boy, that's very American. I think we're back to that bonjour thing, like slow down, travel at a French pace. To, to enjoy France and the French, you just need to slow down. And that's part of traveling. Uh, I know we have, I mean, we're the most visited country in, in the world, so we have lots of sites. But the beauty of traveling is just to stop down, have a glass of wine, a cafe, and, and just meet people. And that's part of the, of traveling too, I think. Well, I agree with both of you quite seriously. Um, I'm gonna ask this last question. You have to pick your favorite, I'll give you two regions. In France. <laughs> in, France. <laughs> in France. Okay. Well, Go ahead. I'd say Brit Brittany and Burgundy. Brittany, because that's where I'm from. And I, I must say, I miss the sea every day because Brittany has a beautiful coastline uh, and a different culture. But I adopted Burgundy. And even though there is no sea, we have rolling vineyards. The people are super friendly. Uh, there is a joie de vivre. People drink a lot of wine. So maybe that's why it helps. And so Burgundy and Brittany, yes. And I, I would say the Dordogne, um, River Valley, that area with the prehistoric art, and Normandy. And Normandy, because I just can't get enough of the history there, from um, the, the Battle of Hastings Tapestry to D-Day Beaches to Mont Saint-Michel. It's just incredible. Well, thank you both very, very much for answering all of our questions and taking the time to share your love of France with us. Remember, folks, we have tomorrow night, we have Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, and we hope that you join us for that.